I invite you to take your Bibles now and turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 25. And when you get there, if you're able, I invite you to rise out of reverence for God's Word. This will be a little bit of a longer reading, so if you do need to sit down at some point and take a break, that is perfectly fine. Acts 25. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let, him, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, and where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met with their accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat upon the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus, who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, about whom the whole Jewish people positioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he should not live any longer. But I found that he had not done anything deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning, among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. For they have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship day and night. And for this hope I am accused by the Jews, O King. 
why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those to which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying, both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This is the word of God. You may finally be seated. We give you some exercise in this church. This is the word of God. It's very difficult to preach these two chapters separate from one another. Because it's all one seamless story in these two chapters. Have you ever faced a situation in your life where you needed courage? Maybe it was something scary or, or daunting or so far outside of your comfort zone that you needed to gather your courage up before you acted. Or perhaps there have been times in your life where you needed courage and you reached for that courage, but you discovered you had none. And so when push came to shove, you just gave up or you failed. Sometimes we feel discouraged. Isn't it interesting that that word discouraged or discouragement has the word courage inside of it? It's like when we are discouraged... We have lost some of our courage to face the difficulties of life. And so then we feel down or blue or helpless. In Scripture, the promises of God can give us hope and courage as He promises to be with His people. For example, Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Such promises from God can be a great remedy to our fears. But when we talk about courage, we realize that we also need courage to walk out the Christian life. The Lord Jesus told us that in this life we would have trouble. He never promised us a rose garden. 
But he said also that we can take heart, for he has overcome the world. Are you in need of courage this morning? Or are you discouraged this morning, needing hope? In our passage today from the book of Acts, we see where Christian courage comes from. We see where Christian hope comes from. And maybe you think, well, this doesn't apply to me today because I'm already feeling pretty brave. I've got all the courage I need right now. I'm not discouraged at all. Well, good for you. But what about when the storms of life will come? And they will come. Will you be ready then to take courage in the Lord and in his promises? We see here in the passage just read that the Apostle Paul needed a lot of courage to stand up in front of a Roman governor, a king, and a princess, along with all the nobles and the, the government officials of that city. And we ask, where did his courage come from? Well, the lesson we learn from Acts 25 and 26 is this. Take courage in resurrection hope. Take courage in resurrection hope. That was the source of the apostles' courage. That can be the source of our courage even today. And this morning we are going to cover these two chapters from the book of Acts, chapters 25 and 26, but we're going to spend most of our time in 26 because really all chapter 25 is doing is it's setting everything up. And so we have four main points from these two chapters. First of all, to Caesar you shall go. And that's going to cover the entire chapter 25. Secondly, our second point is resurrection hope. What does that mean? What does that look like? Thirdly, behold the resurrected Jesus in verses 9 to 23 of chapter 26. And finally, we're going to spend a brief moment at the end looking at these two responses that we see in the king and in the governor where they say this is foolishness or they're offended. And so that's the last part of that chapter. So our first point this morning covers all of chapter 25 for it's centered on Paul exercising the privilege of Roman citizenship in appealing his case to the highest level of Roman justice, to the emperor of Rome. And so our first point this morning is, to Caesar you shall go. And in chapter 25 we see that the new Roman governor, Porcius Festus, has just arrived in Israel. Paul has been waiting in Roman custody for over two years now. And Governor Festus suggests that Paul should be taken back to Jerusalem in order to stand trial. But Paul is a Roman citizen, and every Roman citizen has the right to appeal to the Supreme Court of Rome, which meant standing before the emperor. And so Paul exercises that right in verse 11. He says, I appeal to Caesar. And Governor Festus declares, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Now, why will Paul do this? Why would he do this? He probably could have beat the charges against him. He might have been released if he agreed to go to Jerusalem. At the very end, that's what King Agrippa admits. He says, this guy could have been let go. And even verses 17 to 20 show us that Governor Festus doesn't really understand the accusations against Paul. So he probably would have ended up letting him go. So why does Paul appeal to Caesar? Well, I think there's two main reasons why Paul does this. First, he knows that the Jewish leaders desperately want him dead. Still, after two years, they still want to kill him. And so verse 3 tells us their plan. They ask the new governor to transfer Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem. But you know, it's a long way from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And anything can happen along the way. The Jews are planning an ambush in order to put an end to Paul. And so Paul knows he can't be transferred. And as a last resort, he appeals to go to Caesar in order to preserve his safety. And second, it has been Paul's desire to go to Rome for a long time. And the Lord Jesus himself had promised Paul that he would get him to Rome. And this probably wasn't the way that Paul had expected to visit that great city. 
But appealing to the emperor does get him to the place that he ultimately wants to be. And so Paul appeals to Caesar in order to keep himself safe from the plots of the Jewish leaders who want to kill him and to get himself to Rome one way or the other. But this was a great risk too. Paul could make the long journey all the way to Rome, all the way to the emperor. Caesar could listen for 30 seconds, decide he doesn't like Paul's face, wave his hand, and Paul's head would roll. Paul needs great courage here. He needs great trust in the Lord. And Paul has that courage. Because he knows what he's hoping in. And so I ask, what is the source of your courage this morning? As you live out your Christian life, what are you placing your hope in? In the second half of chapter 25, we see the king of the Jews, King Agrippa, arriving in Caesarea along with his sister, Princess Bernice, in order to pay respects to the new Roman governor. And Governor Festus decides to use this opportunity to get the king's help. Because now the governor has to send this guy Paul to Emperor Nero Caesar, and Festus has no idea how to explain the situation. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to him. And if he wastes the emperor's time, then he could get in a lot of trouble. And so maybe King Agrippa understands these issues better and will help him write a good explanation letter to the emperor. Now before we move on to focus our attention on chapter 26, I do want to draw your focus to one important verse here. It's verse 19, if you look in your Bibles. It shows us what the governor does understand. He really doesn't understand anything, but there is one thing he does get. He doesn't know what the issues are. He, he doesn't really understand what's going on because Paul wasn't charged with any of the crimes that Festus had expected. But there is one detail that he thinks is strange. Verse 19. Instead, the Jewish leaders had some points of dispute with Paul about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. So what does Festus understand? All the other thing is white noise to him, but something has gotten through. He understands that the key issue of the dispute is the resurrection of Jesus. And he has no idea why this matters. He has no idea why it makes the Jewish leaders so angry. But he does understand that Paul's central claim is that this dead man Jesus is actually alive. The central point of dispute here is the resurrection of Jesus. This will be important as we go into our second point in just a moment. So this is, we've covered all of chapter 25. Paul has appealed to Caesar. So Governor Festus says to Caesar, you shall go. Then it says, the next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officials and the prominent men of the city. And at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. So this brings us to our second point this morning, resurrection hope. Paul begins his speech before the governor and the king and the princess by talking about his background and why he is on trial. And look with me at verses 6 to 8. These are the crucial verses. And here Paul's getting warmed up and he's getting passionate here. He says, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers to which all our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Three times in these verses, verses 6 to 8, Paul uses the word hope. And if you have a pencil, I'd invite you to underline the word hope in your Bibles. Three times. Why is Paul on trial? Because of this hope. His trusting hope in the promise made by God to the patriarchs. This is a shared hope. For all the Jewish people have this same hope. This is why Paul says, this is why they are so earnestly worshipping day and night to see this hope fulfilled. But this hope is why Paul stands accused by the Jewish leaders. Now by this time, if you're like me, you're, you're thinking, well, what on earth is this hope? What is Paul placing his hope in? 
What are all the Jews hoping in? Well, verse 8 gives us the answer. Where Paul says, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Ah, this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about God raising the dead. He's talking about resurrection. This is hope in the resurrection on the final day. This is resurrection hope. Paul believes in the resurrection of the dead that was promised by God to the patriarchs. The twelve tribes of Israel also hope to attain the resurrection of the dead. That's why they are worshiping day and night so earnestly. And why is Paul being accused by the Jews? Because he is claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already started. It has begun to happen already. It has been inaugurated by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Paul is claiming that the only way to be resurrected from the dead on the final day is through faith in the resurrected one, the first fruits of resurrection. And if the twelve tribes continue to depend upon their own worship, hoping in their own efforts to attain the resurrection apart from faith in Jesus Christ, then their hope is only wishful thinking after all. And this is the whole reason for this ruckus, this brouhaha, this, this dust-up. This is why the Jews hate Paul so much. This is why the Jews want Paul dead so badly. The Jews hope that they will attain to the resurrection of the dead through their good works of the law, through how good and righteous they are, and enter into the kingdom of God. But Paul says no. The resurrection has already started with Jesus Christ, the perfect righteous one. And so the only way to be resurrected on the final day is to be found in him by faith and enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the resurrection. And so these are two very different ways to salvation. These are two very different ways into the kingdom of God. And only one of these ways is good enough. Let me take a moment just to explain the background of what Paul is saying here. Nowadays, as Christians, we normally say that after a person dies, he goes to heaven or to hell, right? That's what we normally say. But the Bible doesn't actually teach that. Well, pastor, well, if the Bible doesn't teach that, then why do we say it? It's because when we say that, we're actually using an abbreviation of a longer process. The problem is that in the church, we Christians have been using the abbreviation so long that we've forgotten what the full process is. So let me tell you what the Bible teaches. When a person who trusts in Jesus Christ dies, his or her soul goes to be with Jesus, which is better by far. Then, when Jesus comes back, he will bring those souls with him to be reunited with their bodies, and they will resurrect from the dead in glorious recreated bodies just like his. Then, these resurrected ones will stand before his throne to receive judgment. And because they are covered in the blood of the Lamb, they will be found not guilty, and they will enter into the new heavens and the new earth to enjoy God forever and ever. When a person who rejects Jesus Christ dies, his or her soul goes to a place called Sheol in the Old Testament or Hades in the New Testament. This is the waiting place of the dead. Then when Jesus com comes back, by the power of his word, he shall resurrect these souls to re rejoin their bodies, and they will stand before his throne to receive judgment. Because they are not covered by the blood of the Lamb, they will be found guilty in their sins, and they will be cast into the lake of fire, known also as Gehenna, or hell with a capital H, to suffer punishment forever and ever. So yes, a believer in Jesus will eventually enter heaven after they die. And a an, an unbeliever will eventually go to hell after they die. But before these final destinations is the resurrection of the dead, 
which is actually two resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous, that is, righteous in, in Christ, and the resurrection of the unrighteous, who have died in their sins. And so when we understand that background, then we understand why the Jews are so mad at Paul. They are so earnestly worshipping day and night because they desperately want to be found good enough to be part of the resurrection of the righteous and enter into the heavenly kingdom of God. But Paul is saying no. They are going to end up in Gehenna hell, resurrected among the unrighteous because they are not in Jesus Christ. The resurrected one who himself is the resurrection. The one who has already inaugurated the resurrection of the dead in himself. And so Paul is standing there looking the king straight in the eye and he's saying, Look, we share the same hope of resurrection that God has promised. But you, O king, are trusting in yourself to be resurrected while I am trusting in Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. This is why Paul can stand before the power of a Roman governor, a king, and a princess with courage and conviction. It will be the same reason why Paul will be able to stand before Caesar himself. Why? Because Paul had a resurrection hope. And what was Paul's resurrection hope? It was simply this. If Jesus was raised from the dead then Paul will be raised from the dead too. If Jesus was resurrected, then through faith in him, Paul too will be resurrected on the last day. If Jesus' tomb is empty, then one day Paul's tomb will be empty too. Jesus' resurrection is Paul's resurrection. That is the resurrection hope. This is hope with a capital H. When I use this word hope, I want you to hear it with a capital H. Because it's not wishful thinking. Cross my fingers. Oh, I hope it may happen. Maybe, perhaps, if only, I hope. No, it is certain and sure expectation that it will definitely happen. That's hope with a capital H. Paul had a resurrection hope. The certain expectation that one day he would rise from the dead, just as Jesus rose from the dead. And it is this resurrection hope that gave Paul courage and bravery to stand where he's standing and to say what he's saying. Take courage in resurrection hope. Do you have this same hope this morning? This certain expectation beating in your chest? Can you say with conviction along with Paul and all the saints of the church, That because Jesus was raised, therefore I will be raised on the last day. Can you say that Jesus' resurrection is my resurrection? Or, like the Jewish leaders, are you trusting in your own good works and strivings to attain to the resurrection? In that case, your hope really is truly a kind of wishful thinking. Because your works are never ever going to be good enough. But resurrection hope, resting on Jesus Christ. This is a hope that actually gets you out of bed in the morning. This is a hope that gets you moving and shaking. This is a hope that brings glory to God in your life. This is a hope that even fills you with courage and boldness. Do you feel like you have no courage for the Lord? Do you feel like you're not living for Him? That's even hard to get excited about life. It's hard to get up out of bed in the morning. Maybe you've lost sight of your resurrection hope. Maybe you're taking it for granted. Fix your eyes back on the mystery and wonder and splendor and majesty and beauty and power and transcendence and glory and awe of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that brings eternal salvation. That through faith in His name alone, His resurrection means your future resurrection on the final day. Then you will see vitality returning to your spiritual life. Take courage in resurrection hope. 
So far we've seen that the Apostle Paul has a resurrection hope. It gives him courage to stand before the king and princess and governor, and even appeal to stand before the emperor himself. The second part of Paul's defense, verses 9 to 23, he talks about his encounter with the resurrected one. Now this is actually the third time we've heard this story in the book of Acts. Luke, the author, told the story of Paul's vision of the resurrected Christ back in chapter 9. Then Paul told the story again in his own words to the Jewish people in Jerusalem in chapter 22. And now this is the third time where he repeats his story to King Agrippa. And this time is a little different because in this telling, the Lord Jesus speaks a lot more to Paul. And here he commissions Paul as preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. And we're not going to go through all the details here because we've already done so twice. But I do want to draw your attention to how the resurrected Lord finishes speaking in verse 18, if you look with me there. He says to Paul, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So as a Pharisee, Paul had been opposing the early church and the Christian gospel of salvation through Jesus' resurrection with every fiber of his being. He was convinced, heart, mind, and soul, that Jesus of Nazareth was dead, dead, dead. Dead meat, dead as a doornail. He was a rotting corpse somewhere. And then, on the road to Damascus, his whole world is turned upside down when he discovers that not only is Jesus alive, but he is the glorious Messiah and the divine Son of God, Lord of heaven and earth. And so then, for Paul, it all suddenly clicks into place. Jesus has resurrected. The resurrection has already begun, inaugurated by the Messiah himself. But he can only be resurrected if he's righteous, if he's perfectly righteous. So he must be the resurrected righteous one. So then that means, wait, that means salvation is only in him. I can be part of the resurrection of the righteous on the final day, only through Jesus, only by faith in him. I think Paul realizes this all in a millisecond on that day. And the risen Lord says that this message of salvation is also for the Gentiles. To turn them from darkness to light. To be freed from sin and the devil's power. To receive forgiveness of sins and sanctification through faith in Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years later, this is still the very same message. Mm. So what did Paul do next? Well, he said to the king, he said, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. That last verse, verse 23, is the summary of Paul's message. The Messiah had to suffer, but he is the first to resurrect from the dead, ushering in the resurrection of the righteous. And he proclaims the truth of salvation found only in him to both Jews and to Gentiles. And here yet again we see how the resurrection is placed front and center. If the Messiah is the first to rise from the dead, that means there will be many more to follow. Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead, among many brothers and sisters, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Take courage in resurrection hope. Paul gained much courage from seeing the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus. Because Jesus was resurrected, Paul was convinced that by faith in Jesus, he too would be resurrected and saved on the final day. And this morning, we have not seen the resurrected Lord in his glory, like Paul did, but we do share the same faith the same conviction, 
the same expectation, the same hope. And rather than shrinking back in fear or discouragement, knowing that Christ's resurrection guarantees your salvation through the resurrection, that ought to fill you with courage and boldness and strength to meet whatever trials and hardships life has to throw at you. And this brings us to our last point this morning, the response to resurrection hope. Because the last part of the of the chapter reveals two reactions to Paul's testimony, two responses to preaching uh, the preaching of the resurrection. One is the Gentile reaction coming from the Roman governor. The second is the Jewish reaction coming from King Agrippa. Look at how Governor Festus cries out, Paul, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. You're insane. How can you believe such silly things? This is utter foolishness. Then look at King Agrippa. King Agrippa gets all huffy, like a king does, when Paul presses him. And the king says, are you going to trick me into becoming a Christian so easily and so quickly? This is the attitude of being offended. You're not going to pull the wool over my eyes so easily, Paul. And scripture recognizes that people will respond to the gospel in either of these two ways. That it is offensive, or that it is utter foolishness. For this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and a folly to Gentiles. This is exactly what we see happening here when the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed, the Jewish king is offended, and the Gentile governor thinks it's all poppycock. And as Christians, sometimes when we see people rejecting the truth of the gospel, it can even be a source of discouragement for us. We can lose heart and wonder, well, what's the point of sharing the good news if people are just going to be offended all the time and think we're crazy? But Paul was not discouraged. He took courage in resurrection hope. And this gave him a higher perspective that God would use him as he saw fit. And so Paul can genuinely tell the king and all those gathered there that day in verse 29, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all those who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. It was Paul's wish that the gospel would take root in the king's heart, in the princess's heart, even in the governor's heart. For Paul understood the truth of 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 to 16. We are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, but to the other the fragrance of life. The Apostle Paul needed great courage to stand before a governor, a king, and a princess. And he would need even more courage to stand before the emperor of Rome. He needed courage to avoid the murderous plots of the Jewish leaders. He needed courage to proclaim the gospel boldly. He needed courage when the gospel was ignored or rejected. And the courage he needed came from his hope in the resurrection. That because Jesus is risen, Paul would one day rise from the dead as well. And that same source of courage is available to you today as you live out the Christian life. Where is your courage located today? What is the source of your confidence this morning? Is it found in plans and schemes of your own making? Is it placed in people who will disappoint? Or things that will pass away? Or will you find a courage that is anchored in eternal truths and unshakable promises that will never fade? Take courage in resurrection hope. Let us pray. Father God, once again we stand before your word.
And may we always be a people who tremble before it. For your word says that this is the one whom I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let us be such a people, Father. Let us tremble before you. And that in trembling before you and in fear of you, we may not have fear of man or fear of circumstances or fear of situations. But that we would be a people of courage and boldness and confidence, not found in ourselves or in our own plans or in, even in the people around us, but rather it is a confidence found in Jesus Christ. It's a conviction founded upon his resurrection that will one day be our resurrection. May it be a courage that's found in resurrection hope. And so, Father, I pray that you would pour out your grace upon your people. That as we reflect upon these things, as we leave this place, that you would show us grace to, to grow that resurrection hope within us. That it may not be something that we take for granted, or that we ignore, or that we treat cheaply. But as we reflect upon the glory of the gospel of salvation, how Christ's death and his resurrection leads to my eternal salvation, that this would actually be a source of peace and of comfort and joy and, yes, even courage as we walk out our Christian life, as we face the hardships of life, some that are the results of sin, some that are the results of just uh, general life, but many of which are the result of our decision to follow Jesus Christ and surrender our lives to Him. And so, Father, when those hardships come, may we be a people who do not just roll over and surrender and throw our hands up and just give up. But because we have a hope that transcends this life, we can say, I will keep going. Because I trust in Jesus that his resurrection one day will be my resurrection on the final day. That because of his perfect righteousness, I will be part of the resurrection of the righteous. Not because of anything good that I've done, but because I trust in him alone. Father, may we be such a people that we grow in knowledge and understanding of these things. And Father, we may never be called to stand before a governor or a king or a princess or even a mayor or a judge. We may never face that. But Father, the same courage that pumped through the veins of the apostle is available to us to face whatever life throws at us. Because our hope is not in this life, but in the life to come. So Father, we pray that you would commend these things to our hearts and minds as we leave this place. That by our, our growth in knowledge and understanding, you would be glorified in our lives. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray all these things. Amen.